Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations, befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneers shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Canna Cribs Podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Canna Cribs Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Morin, and today's interview is with Jason Talmadge, the owner of Higher Standard Cannabis Consulting. And in this interview, Jason gives us a deep dive into his 20 years of cannabis cultivation knowledge. He shares the horror stories and success stories from his consulting career and explains the ideal mindset one needs when you're trying to start a cannabis grow operation in the industry today. Enjoy. Growing cannabis on a commercial scale is difficult. That's why companies hire experts like Jason. Jason travels all around the country solving problems, everything from lighting setups to pest control and even IPM strategy. And when it comes to controlling your environment, there's one company that I've seen across the majority of the farms that we film for Canner Cribs and Deep Roots. That company, my friends, is Quest. You might have heard of them. So whether you're growing in one room or 100 rooms, Quest can help you master that environment. Check them out at growershouse.com. I'll link it in the show notes. Now let's dive into the episode. Jason, welcome to the Canner Cribs podcast. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, so uh, our paths have crossed. I know that you're in the consulting space at, at Higher Standard Cannabis Consulting, but uh, you have a uh, lengthy career in the cannabis industry uh, before a lot of this uh, recreational you know, markets uh, came to be what it is today. Can you tell me about your, your background? Well, I'd like to say it's a long one, so I'll try to you know be encapsulated as much as possible, but um, I suppose it's somewhat interesting when i got into it i just got back from backpacking across uh central america and you know and i had been growing cannabis for a couple years just uh you know just learning at home uh since i was 19 and then when i was 23 uh as soon as i got back from that trip i had a very dear friend of mine call me within two or three days and let me know that he had cancer Mm. and um you know just just trying to give him something to look past look to past his uh, illness said you know what you're gonna get better I'm going to move up to Washington. We're going to grow some medical cannabis and uh, take another trip. Wow. And yeah, so and I did and he got better and I moved up uh, to Washington and we did that very thing. And, um, you know, we found that we both had a talent for it. And uh, so we stuck with it. And here, tw- almost 20, 20 plus years later, tw- almost 25 years later, uh, it's, you know, it's been now a career at this point. That's incredible. So it all started with a medicinal purpose for the plant and it providing did. medicine for for someone dear to you i mean that that's super powerful it, it it brought meaning to it in a way that you know just uh say just doing it re- for recreational purposes i mean don't get me wrong the freedom of, the freedom of choice issues that are attached to that are important to me as well but um there is something there's just an added dynamic when uh dealing with the medical side there's no doubt about it yeah so uh what part of washington did you move up to well, it was a small town uh, about no oh, about an hour outside of Seattle called uh, Port Orchard at the time. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in Arlington, which is a small town as well, just about an hour outside of Seattle. <laughs> oh, I know it well. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've gone through a lot of changes and and cannabis, you know, partly being a driver of those changes. I I kind of moved in well, I moved in 2008, so I moved right before the the quote-unquote green rush. Uh, entered into to Arlington for some, you know, probably much needed change and evolution. Uh, so did you uh, take part in, you know, helping form the initial, you know, recreational market in Washington? I would say I had uh, more influence uh, in the development of the medicinal. Although okay. when I, yeah, although when I entered into the recreational, although there's an interesting backstory to that as well. Um, you know, I, w- I started at one of the top grows in the uh, in the state and you know shortly quickly pretty quickly took them uh you know with the help of my team of course to the top spot in the country wow um was able to increase their yields by about 30 percent and um you know that was great but the medicinal side uh you know they had it was really raw when uh we entered into it and um you know you had to stack licenses 
Uh, and what we would do is, uh, we, you know, you could have three licenses with 15 plants a piece. So what I, what I did is I just sought out people who were quite ill, you know, mm. with uh, severe disabilities or illnesses. And I uh, mm. took their licenses and then they became a designated provider for them. Okay. And then, so every crop, I would give them a pound or two off the top or the money from it, which also allowed a lot of, you know, the people, the sick people that I dealt with to, you know, some of them to get off social security, to start paying uh, bills on their own, to give them just a little something to feel good about themselves wow. with. And of course that, that has an effect on the immune system as well. So um, even though it was a little disjointed, uh, once we figured out how to get around some of those laws and issues, it did it, it was done we were able to do it in a way that was able to help people in additional ways mm-hmm. yeah that's a really good point of uh, financial freedom and less burden financially uh, to lessen the stress which improves the immune system it's all connected um, as you just put it, it that's a really good point to bring up um, so uh, was that company Northwest Cannabis Solutions that you worked at on on the rec side it is. That was okay. my entry into the recreational, which um, so in Washington, they when they legalized recreational, unlike some of the other states, they eliminated medical. And that, is that really, right? Wow. Yeah. Which it was devastating to. Oh, my gosh. I did not just, know that. Yeah, it, it was terrible, frankly, and, and also alluded to it being a money grab a bit um, mm. by the state. Um, the probably the worst thing to come out of that, in my opinion, is you know we weren't able to help you know those people that we helped get off social security we were just talking about go mm-hmm. right back on it um mm-hmm. and they lost their uh their free medicine as well um i had a lot of friends who you know did things like cash in their 401ks uh you know mortgage their homes did you know did whatever they could to open dispensaries and then they all had to shut them down because they did what they said was a lottery system to give out licenses. I don't know anyone without a, that didn't have a lot of money that was able to get one. So, which was it wasn't kind of, a true lottery. Well, you know, there's rumors, but uh, it, I think it was interesting that most of the people that did win them, not everyone, but most of the people did have money. And like I said, most most of the dispensary owners I knew lost their business, which they were unable mm. to get that, you know, their 401ks back or whatever they did to invest in that. Uh, for growers like myself, it was a little different um, because I was able to transition. I still have all my equipment um, from my old grows. I usually set up four to five uh, grows at a time uh, with three people attached to each one in, in addition to a grower. Um, That's a lot. At least... It, it was. We were we were one of the larger producers medically in the state, and uh, you know did well. Our, you know I, I did a, most of my own genetics, and uh, our strains were the top sellers at almost everywhere they were. Which uh, you know we had a lot of fun with that. Um, and again, though I you know the growers were able to transition at least some of us. Mm. Uh, one, although one thing that I did have an advantage over some of the growers, which you know some people would term garage growers, is I had to create a business model with a very strict principles that we had to follow to keep things going with my medical, uh, with my medical uh, co-op, I guess we called it. Okay. Uh, it wasn't a true co-op, but you know, that was what we had to label it legally. Um, so I was able to, you know, cause that is a problem that a lot of people find in rec and looking for grow masters or directors of cultivation is they know how to grow plants, but they don't know, uh, how to run crews. They don't know how to establish, uh, you know, budgets and, and manage those budgets. They don't mm-hmm. know how to create repeatable SOPs or training programs or set up departments or just industry standards. Yeah, for, so, for uh, any industry, right? I mean, just yeah. business 101 of uh, starting a company, HR, management, proper accounting. Um, yeah. It's pretty unique that you, you bring both to the table. You have the cultivation background and pair that with your, you know, business management background. Well, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be in a position to have to create that model. And, um, you know, a lot of people didn't necessarily go in that direction. Uh, it was hard to predict how that would affect the future of my career. Unfortunately, it affected it in very positive ways. Mm, mm. So um, I, I want to shine a light on a, a special project of yours that you've been working on um, outside of the cannabis industry. But um, it, it goes to show, you know, your heart. Right. And, and your heart of service um, all the way back to, you know, uh, growing for your friend initially um, to uh, child trafficking now. 
um, with this nonprofit that you're part of. Um, can you tell me about uh, Hope Railroad, uh, the mission, and, and uh, what you're working towards there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, something that's dear to my heart. Um, you know, it's lost a little steam since we established it, but uh, I would love, you know, actually hoping to our discussion on the podcast today may bring some more people uh, into it that we could uh, really ramp up again. Um, kind of came about, you know, some of us may remember back uh, in 2016 when, uh, you know, there was a, a ban on immigrants coming in and people were stuck in the airports. And, uh, you know, there's a big, a big deal about, you know, they just basically cut off immigration. And, uh, you know, what got me is that was uh, actually Holocaust Awareness Day that that happened mm. on. And that's why uh, we called it Hope Railroad because of, of that. We, the idea was spawned um, because of that odd, you know, coincidence. You know? Um, so, <clears throat> you know, with the immigration issues and especially with uh, trafficking, it's, it's, you know, started doing some research into it. And it turned out that as a lot of these trafficking victims, you know, they're able to file for a special visa. And uh, while they're while that's being investigated to, to confirm that they were trafficked and to be able to prosecute their traffickers, they're protected, basically like a witness protection. Uh, okay. And I, I started coming in and deporting these people while they were waiting for that approval investigation to, to take place. And then once they were, so they were basically throwing people back into slavery, um, including their you know children, so mm. there is, you know, let's have, let's throw some fresh new slaves out there. It was kind of, it was just heartbreaking, heart wrenching. Mm. So the railway, we started, you know, uh, of course, a lot of it was bringing awareness to people because very few people were aware of that. And also to get people to get uh, trafficking victims out. Of, so there was two states at the time that set up safe houses. One was Missouri and one was in New York. So we were taking uh, helping people in states that ICE was coming in and doing that and deporting when they shouldn't have while they were waiting for that visa to be approved. And we were getting them safely to Missouri and New York. So they could, so they just had a safe place until that visa was approved. And then they were no longer subject to deportation. And wow. then that, that's at the core of it. So we did it quite secretly. And of course, uh, spreading awareness on the issue is probably the paramount uh, yep. concern. Because yeah, people just, aren't aware of that. Well, that's that's why I wanted to bring it up today. I know it's not directly, you know, how to grow or your growing background, but I know it's very near and dear to your heart and um, something that I wanted to provide, you know, the, the Canada Cruise platform to, to share more about that. And um, is there anywhere online that people can go to learn more uh, before we, we dive into the, the heavy, you know, grower questions? Yeah, well, you know, hoperailroad.com and okay. uh, have a website that, uh, you know, that has uh, quite a bit of information for people. Uh, it's a resource and um, also a place for trafficking victims to mm. contact us and uh, if they need help. And um, it's, uh, you know, hoperailroad.com. And I do appreciate you bringing some uh, attention to this today yeah. because it is outside of growing, but uh, maybe more important. We're all humans, right? I mean, yes. so it doesn't yes. matter what your career profession is. Um, we're sharing stories and um, it's not just cannabis. We're, we're talking about the, the global scale of what cannabis can do for all of us and, and the people um, helping to, to push that change. And um, you're a, a great example of that. And, uh, you know, your, your heart is in the right place. And I commend you for, for all your work on that project. I'll, I'll make sure to link it in the show notes um, so people can go to that website and learn more. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nick. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. So um, I, I saw it in uh, my research that you recently won the um, 2019 High Times Cup um, for your CBD flower. So walk me through that experience. What was that like? What were the genetics that you submitted? Uh, can you tell me more about that? Absolutely. I mean, that was quite the experience, uh, surreal in, in a way, um, as most, you know, most people of our, my generation, uh, you know, just read about that is, is a far away thing. Yeah. And so, um, we we're lucky enough to have it at the, uh, at the hemp fest, uh, here in Seattle. And, uh, so it was huge, hundreds of thousands of people there. Whoa. And, oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. That was amazing. That and, huge. uh, 
you know, and, uh, you know, just to, it's just a big stage. And, uh, you know, there was many different categories. And um, so and I had just come on to a new farm there and, and oddly enough, it was our first crop and uh, which also I was kind of exciting. Uh, and the genetics were can of Sue. Um, okay. I know yeah. Harley Sue. Is that, uh, yes, in, yeah, in that family? is, that is, it's half the genetics of it, okay. of course. So, uh, and, and can of tonic. And so okay. it does have a bit of THC, so it wouldn't be classified as hemp. So it still was cannabis, but, uh, but high CBD cannabis with, uh, you know, the THC was oh, about 3%. And, uh, our, uh, CBD was coming in at uh, over 25%, uh, the levels, uh, which were very high. Of course, uh, other... Yeah, cat- incredible. Other, yeah, yeah it, it's a fantastic strain. And, um, you know, if you do if you do things correctly, the, str- uh, the genetics will take... They'll take care of what you yeah. need them to do. Were so. you surprised by the results? I was not, actually. But okay. uh, I was and I wasn't at the same time. You know, sometimes you just have to accept what's in front of you. Um, but like I say, it was it was surreal. Yeah. So I suppose I was surprised. Um, but the dedication I put into into growing, you know, I I was, um, you know, I expected to do something there. But uh, at the same time, just appreciative of, of any of the accolades and to win the and it was we actually to win our medal. It was it was fantastic. And I have to give credit to our team, uh, my team of growers, my team of managers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it all, it's a group effort and that this doesn't happen with one person's oversight or work. And, uh, I just had a fantastic team with good yeah. genetics and, uh, and my passion and love. And, uh, we were able to bring, uh, bring the medal home. Nice. Congratulations on that, that victory there. Um, you. do you, uh, have any trends that you've seen in, in CBD genetics, uh, recently that you can share? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, with hemp being approved by the Department of Ag- Agriculture, uh, you know, there is innovations with genetics. Uh, I mean, every day more more than we can keep up with, frankly, and uh, tons of strains out there. And you know, with uh, and of course with the CBD genetics, I would say that the biggest changes maybe don't have have to do with things other than the genetics themselves. But I would say interstate commerce is the thing to bring the most attention to with CBD. Mm. Uh, we can grow CB, we can grow medicine, CBD uh, strains and hemp, which is cannabis, just with low THC in it. Right. And, and it, with a different label, legal label on it. And uh, we can ship it anywhere, which makes it accessible to people that didn't, don't, you know, that not every state has medical cannabis approved. Right. But the hemp side of it, um, now people can, they can receive that anywhere they live. And that's an amazing thing. And you can leverage the, uh, regional climate that might be a little bit more, you know, suited, better suited to grow hemp and yield a, a higher, you know, uh, CBD, uh, cultivar than maybe in another part of the country, but have the power to leverage that in one state and then ship it across the country somewhere else. Um, that's, yeah. that's powerful. And, and to me, I'm, I'm looking forward for, one day um, in our lifetime where we can do that with, uh, you know, cannabis and, and a high THC, you know, uh, cultivar. Um, that Do you think that's where we're heading? Do you see that happening in the next five, ten years? That is the exact timeline I usually cite uh, okay. when asked that question. I think within five to ten years, although, you know, it's dependent on so many variables yeah. and so many factors. And variables we don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we can't even conceive of all the different things that need to happen, even though we, you know, I mean, we can simplify it in a way, legalize it federally. But of course, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. And um, it's a lot of it depends on the leadership of our country, of course. And, you know, we're just going to have to wait and see. But the good news on that is, is there are it's such a big issue now for I mean, there are very few issues that are in the public eye more than this over the past few years and uh you know there's a lot going on in so many other areas as some of which we talked about earlier um that i don't want to say it's taking a back seat and but maybe it should to for some of the things like the things we discussed earlier but it's still it's still there in people's minds and i do think within five you know i'd be shocked if it took to, uh, 10 years for it to happen i would expect five five years is probably a good timeline yeah and it goes back to the team you know the the team to take uh a high times cannabis cup for one flower or a team 
you know, at the federal government level to uh, allow this for everyone. Um, it just goes back to the people, right? Um, yes, and always. and states providing good examples and models to follow. Um, I'm sorry to hear that that experience um, that you saw in in Washington. Um, I I was not familiar with that. That just you know completely blows my mind. I should have known that, but I'm glad that I learned it here today from from your experience firsthand. Um, so let's dive into uh, medicinal versus recreational state markets. Is, is there any state that's doing it really well in your opinion that uh, we can model uh, potentially the federal government after or new states coming online uh, to, to look at? You know, to be honest, I would look at Oregon and, uh, and Colorado, and which were some of the first to do that, but they integrated the two mm. and gave uh, owners the option to, you know, just transitions to straight recreational or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, dispensaries that have both, you know, you're just on one side of the building or, you know, they have one yeah. side of the shop is a recreational, the other side is medicinal. And that's important because when people are coming in for medicine, the atmosphere matters. It really, mm. really does, you know, because if you're not careful, people will feel diminished. Mm. They will feel invalidated, you know? I mean, it's a it goes to even like what we were talking about about giving people something to look forward to. Even my entry into it wasn't necessarily about growing the cannabis. It was trying to give somebody something to look to past their illness. Mm. And so to to try to make their illness just something they just, it's kind of just something they deal with on the side, but it's not the everything of their life. And atmosphere, you know, walking into just a, you know, a fun party atmosphere does not necessarily make somebody that's sick feel safe, especially when we're talking about people that haven't used recreationally, which is a, sh a ton of uh, patients. Uh, you know, a lot of the older generations, people of, of older generations that come in that realize that it has medicinal value, but they they have no interest in getting, getting high. Uh, they just want to help their condition. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to walk into a store that feels like a, a head shop or something. Right. So I, I do believe that it's important to have that separation. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of people complain about um, the quality of medicinal <laughs> cannabis compared to recreational cannabis. Yeah. Can you uh, teach me what's going on there in, in your opinion as an owner of uh, grow operations and as a consultant? Um, are there different rule books that they're playing by? Is there you know different psychology in the mind of a, a business owner for a medical grow operation compared to recreational? I know it, it definitely varies state to state, but um, is there a, a framework or mindset that you could share with me today? Absolutely. Um, well, in my opinion, it mostly has to do with scale. I mean, uh, mm. generally medical grows are a bit smaller, uh, and are able to be a little more involved in, in the plant care. Um, it can be done on, on scale for recreational, but you got to have the right grower and at a smaller grow, you know, there's more growers with the experience necessary to do that but as soon as you get to a certain <clears throat> square footage you know i mean when you right. get really massive there's a big difference between say growing one room with a perpetual cycle and then once you start having multiple rooms that you're that you need to have on a perpetual cycle suddenly the scheduling becomes so much more complex and so the you know the departments need to be different the setup needs to be different and they're just in areas that uh, most growers don't have any experience in. Mm. It's not their fault. Uh, it's nobody's fault except maybe the, the federal governments, I suppose. Um, but even even we're talking about bringing in academians, uh, you know, they don't have experience with cannabis. So mm. they have the scientific acumen, but they don't have the holistic approach to apply it in, in a lot of cases. So for me, it has, it, you know, simplify uh, and encapsulate or just say it, it has to do with scale mostly. Yeah, well, that's a, a great response. It makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so we're going to take our, our first break, Jason. When we get back, uh, we're going to dive uh, headfirst into your consulting work that you do today. Awesome. Sounds fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Hey, hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I'm not sure if you've heard the word on the street yet, but our friends over at growershouse.com are selling Quest factory refurbished units for 15% off regular pricing with a three-year warranty. That's a smoking deal. By the time you're listening to this, you might have already missed out. So go on over to growershouse.com and see for yourself. And if you haven't been to Grower's House, they have a lot of different growing essentials, such as trellis netting, trim trays, and more. Now back to the episode. 
All right, we are back. Um, and I'd love to dive into uh, your consulting work today. So are you mostly working with uh, new grow operations? Is this like their first time running a business? Can you can you uh, teach me a little bit more about your clientele? Sure. Um, well, with the experience that I have and the other growers that I have working for me on the consultant side, um, really all all in about seed to sale and okay. so we have clients that uh you know we help set up uh from the ground on up uh also a lot of clients who just needs uh, things like diagnostics work um i have a unique uh, ipm program that uh uses principles that aren't really common knowledge in the industry uh you know diagnostics <laughs> is big uh, de- in department set up and and you know rarely have i found the departments uh set up in the, in the grows uh, that they're set up properly or mm. at least in a way that could streamline efficiency the way it needs to be teach me about that what what's typically not set up properly and how do you fix that in in your work well you know uh, maybe i'll use an example of a of a grow i worked at for a year um they when i so when i came on they had just one floating crew of like 20 people or so and uh they just would float around with a you know with their grow master looking for things to do uh you know they weren't tasking things out the way they should you know there's so you got to control all the variables that you're able to because you know there's so many that you're unable to see so if you control all the variables that you notice it leaves you more prepared to handle the ones that you didn't yeah and uh, so with the departments <clears throat> you know i you need a vegetation department, especially at scale. If, if it's a very small grow, then that then that still works. But once you reach a, cer- a certain scale, you uh, you know you need a veg department, vegetation department, and then a flowering department. You need a post production department. You need an IPM department, uh, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. Um, you know, it goes on and on. The packaging department. Uh, you know, if you're processing oils, you have to have a separate department for procurement. Uh, if you're not producing enough in-house uh, to make your oils and fill your flower needs. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot. And in fact, uh, when I came onto that grow, I, you know, from what, really the first thing I did was split that one, that one crew into five different departments. Smart. And uh, can you teach me, let's say a couple different phases, you know, of scaling, right? So yeah. let's say, uh, a 5,000 square foot, you know, grow operation to 50,000 to let's say like, you know, full blown, um, you know, and, and maybe you just have a, a handful of growers in the beginning, you know, maybe it's a, a grower slash owner that has a couple helping hands. Um, and then that next level, and then that that third level where, yeah. you know, they're at scale. So uh, what what are the, the initial roles that you help implement in that team um, through each level? So, okay, so I would say with the square footage and, uh, you know, splitting things up at about 5,000 square feet, uh, you can still get away with having one floating crew. And in fact, that's probably would be the way to go. You don't want to needlessly pay managers, you know, the salaries that that come with those positions if they if it can be done by one person. Once you hit about 10,000 square feet is where I would say you should probably consider, uh, you know, splitting it up at least into two departments. A vegetation and uh, flowering at that at that level you could still get away with having your IPM department and your post-production department uh, you know integrated usually post-production will be part of the flowering department of course uh, compliance uh, would usually be a separate department but that could be done by the vegetation department normally at that scale um, and so on and so forth once you get above 10,000 that's when you really got to have to start considering just uh, you know splitting up into those five or more departments and right. Um, you know, that, cause that's when you have to start splitting up rooms to the point where you have, you know, three, four, five, six, on and on, you know, at Northwest Cannabis Solutions, we have 45 separate flowering rooms, for example. 45? 45. To maximize, yes. uh, control, like you guys wanted them smaller to have a more controlled environment and decrease the spread of, you know, diseases and pests. Yeah, cross contamination is always an issue, especially at that level. Which, of course, you know, you need to keep all the rooms contained. You make sure your crews are going in Tyvex. Make sure you're identifying rooms that have problems. Make sure they're worked on at the end of the day by specific people that uh, have their Tyvex. Um, I always, also, I think it's always a good idea at that scale to have, uh, you know, 
uniforms, I suppose, you know, overalls or Tyvek's that they wear every day. Um, so, but also, uh, you know, it keeps your product fresh. If you mm. just have, you know, it's, you have a 50,000 square foot facility that brings everything down at once, you know, you're not going to be able to sell it all at once either. It take, you know, even if you're selling it fast. True. So having that perpetual cycle and fresh product coming in all the time helps increase, uh, you know, helps increase quality. Yeah. What about some common misconceptions with uh, new business owners in the cannabis space that you've come across? Well, I'm sure that's like a weekly basis for you. <laughs> it is, and it's a loaded question too. Yeah. Um, with a with a just a so many different answers that could be put on that, you know, apply to that question. But some of the bigger pr- things I encounter, you know, profit margins aren't really what a lot of people, a lot of owners expect. So, which that means, of course, managing budgets it becomes so critical, and mm. and of course, a lot of growers don't necessarily have experience with that. Um, you know, you need a really varied skill set to manage and grow. And also, it, it's a team effort. So, you know, as we've been discussing, I would say trying to just stick a couple people to manage the entire facility is a big mistake as well. And that's why I encounter so many times, you know, the first thing we need to do is split up into departments. And that includes having, you know, an operations manager, uh, a general manager that, that works together with the director of cultivation. And, uh, you know, I would say also um, <clears throat> infrastructure, investing mm. in infrastructure. A lot of a lot of owners tend to try to, I don't know, maybe a good way to put it is their eyes are bigger than their stomach. <laughs> That's been a nice thing. Uh, yeah, yeah or even trying to get a square pig into a round hole. There you go. Um, you know, oftentimes I find that, uh, those infrastructure problems come with uh, the HVAC systems. You know, the mm. owners don't want to invest in a state of the art system. And then suddenly they don't have the climate controls they need to maximize production. And, you know, there's you have to consider the ROI on all these things, the return mm-hmm. on investment, which I, you know, I haven't encountered many growers that do that. And everything that requires money should there should, should have an ROI done on it by either director of cultivation or the GM or operations manager, depending upon uh, what area they're we're considering or talking about. So making sure that the the infrastructure and equipment is what it needs to be to produce the amount of cannabis necessary to you know feel, to feel payroll you know mm-hmm. to pay all the bills because again profit margins aren't necessarily what a lot of owners think they're going to be especially when if they don't get the right grower and their production isn't maximized or and efficiency needs to be streamlined as well i mean maximize efficiency maximize production, uh, manage the budget very carefully, get the right management team into a place. I would also say uh, it's very important, you know, a lot of these owners look into other businesses if they have them and see if they can apply any uh, any areas that they found success in those businesses, see if they can apply them to the cannabis, say, you know, if they have a if a ro- they have a robust marketing team or a marketing department that they could, you know, they could use in, in their cannabis company or that reminds me of Fat Panda. I went yeah. out to film <laughs> Fat Panda in Washington a couple oh, years yeah. ago. It was one of our first Canna Cribs episodes. And uh, the owners came from a marketing background. And to me, it's like that that packaging popped. Those logos, the brand experience when they would buy the product. When it is, you know someone would go into a dispensary and buy the product, um, it, it stood out. And I think yeah. that's a really good point leveraging skill sets from other industries as a business owner that's your competitive advantage you know in addition to your team and your growers that you foster oh indeed i mean there's no question about it i mean you you hit the nail on the head there with that uh if that panda is a great example now during my time uh at northwest cannabis solutions especially you know we kind of jostled back and forth that was the one competitor that we your had. arch rival they were our arch <laughs> rival it was a friendly competition that uh, and and frankly, well, during my time there, we they only I think there was two months that they were able to uh, overtake us. What was it uh, like the I five hundred two website? I forgot what it was. There's a website where it lists like all the rankings. Yeah, it, it actually even goes into more detail than that. It lists the rankings. It, it, it has to be reported uh, how much revenue was uh, you know wow. the companies make every month. It, it actually in quarters they they report it every quarter, um, and uh, produ- how much production. So. 
Uh, Check you the know, scoreboard, homies. Yeah. <laughs> well, frankly, I, I I feel fortunate that that exists because a lot of that's a problem a lot of growers encounter is that they their uh, careers are hard to verify. Mm. And um, you know, since uh, most of my career has been in Washington, it's easy to look up at what I've done, and you know, I've had various articles done on me, speaking engagements, and uh, and whatnot. But that I five hundred two website is a godsend as far as uh, verification because that's mm. another. You know, we should even I should say, uh, you know, another thing with ownership, do your due diligence. You know, don't just hire a guru because he talks a big game um, because they just, you know, they're marketing themselves as well. So due diligence, verify. It's hard to do because, you know, there's not very many places, but Washington growers do have that advantage. I'm sure you have come across your fair share of horror stories that you had to <laughs> kind of like kitchen nightmare or rescue whatever that show is where you have to like yeah. go in and uh do an overhaul you know i i have growers um you know such as yourself friends in the industry that do consulting work and um they reach out to me because they they know me through can of cribs and they're like hey nick like can you create a new show with me where i go around the world and fix grow operations and i'm like that sounds amazing. Like, yes, <laughs> one day we'll get there. Like, my plate is really full right now. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. for you, like, I'm sure you've seen a lot of horror stories. Could you share one? Maybe Sans, the the name of the company or owners. But uh, sure. could you share a story with me that you came in and fixed and maybe provide some lessons for other growers so they don't have to, you know, live that experience twice? You know, I mean, the one that pops out to me the most is I, I came into a grow um, and they – had lost their, uh, they had a good grower on staff, um, inexperienced as far as running the business, but there was enough people in place on the, uh, on that side of it that they were able to maintain. And he did a good job in caring for the plants, staying on schedule, keeping things clean. Um, when they lost him, the per, they promoted somebody in house that was just, you know, didn't, he, he just was in over his head a bit. Mm. Uh, not, not, that he was bad at what he did. He just didn't have the knowledge, uh, the base of knowledge quite yet. And uh, so when I came in, you know, it was a lot of fixing as far as, you know, just putting in training programs, repeatable SOP. Mm. But the but the nightmare was in that infrastructure, the HVAC system, frankly. So they had had a company that, uh, had, they had a contract with to come do maintenance on their, uh, on their HVAC system. And they were coming in and, you know, apparently doing maintenance on it and the front end went down which is a control system for it and they were apparently just giving these guys a no bid say we'll give you a no bid contract that won't go over eighty thousand dollars and for the front end and they couldn't give them any answers on what what really needed to be fixed so when i came in and the operations manager should have been on top of this frankly but the when i came in you know i went around looked at the looked at the hvac systems and they didn't look like they were being maintained to me so um hmm. i called in three other hvac companies to give us bids and to take a look and uh there was one in particular and i'm happy to mention their name because uh, i still work with them at uh at times which is tcms they were fantastic could you say that one more time that company name yeah tcms okay and they're one of the larger hvac companies in uh, the western united states and canada um and one of their vice presidents uh, came in and, and worked with me to assess everything that needed to be done. Uh, you know, our fr uh, front end system, they were able to fix that without, you know, $80,000. Well, they did it for like five. Oh, um, wow. Yes. And but the biggest thing is they did discover that the maintenance, you know, quote unquote maintenance that was being done by this other company simply wasn't being done. And this is, goes to they weren't changing the filters. They weren't, uh, you know, they should have been pressure washing it three or four times a year at least. Uh, the the filtration systems in the in the condenser units, um, and so when those got clogged up, also they weren't putting in the paper filters. So uh, one of the and there's two parts to this nightmare. Mm -hmm. The other part is they were failing testing for what was called a gram negative bile tolerant bacteria. Now that's one of the things that they test for on cannabis here in Washington. They couldn't figure out where it was coming from, what was happening. And when I noticed, and there was a fish fertilizer company that was next to us, right? So they were bringing in fish. And oh, it was, no, I see yeah, where this is going. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and I, I should also mention that most bacteria that you find associated with fish are bile tolerant, gram negative bacteria. So with that understanding, I, I saw it sloshing over the edges of the truck onto the 
under the dirt that they were driving by our building on. And so what happened was called a drift. And, you know, it's something I dealt with when managing greenhouse grows. You have to coordinate with the farmers around you because when they're tilling up their farms or tilling up the soil, it kicks up, uh, you know, the soil gets kicked up in the air mm. and it contains pesticides that may contaminate, uh, you, know, vi- uh, you know, viruses, fungus, you know, verticillium, uh, fusarium, will, it's a big one. So you need to make sure you close your vents. Um, but since they weren't putting in the pay, uh, filters right in the condenser units, that drift, the dust was getting in through uh, our, our HVAC systems and then getting into an environment that, uh, you know, the other grower just wasn't keeping clean enough. So it was wet everywhere, uh, just soggy soil in all the rooms all over the everywhere you looked. And so it, once it got in there, then it spread. So I identified it, talked with the port and they mm-hmm. uh, agreed to pave the road in the back. So that helped with the drift. Also, the fish fertilizer place was very, very good to work with us. And they uh, took measures to stop that from happening. But the biggest thing is we brought in the the right uh, HVAC company. Now, it, it the contract went from something like 5,000 to, you know, upwards of 100. But that also guaranteed any equipment failures. And, um, you know, it was difficult convincing management or ownership the necessity of that. But once I did it, I put together an ROI then it was easy for them to see. And frankly, oftentimes it is difficult to, you know, convey important information to ownership with if they don't have an understanding of what's happening. And it's important for growers not to get frustrated by that. Mm-hmm. It's our job to find a way to relay the information that's where it sinks in. And don't just pound your fist on the table, get frustrated and say, why aren't you listening to me? Mm. No, take a moment and find a different delivery for the information. If that doesn't work, find another delivery. If that doesn't work, do it again and again and again. I don't care if it takes a hundred different ways. Leave your frustration aside Mm. and find Detach that emotional reaction. Well, it's our job. It's our job. So um, it's not about us. It's not about our egos. It's not about our, you know, why aren't they listening to me? It's about um, striving for excellence and finding a way and finding a path towards that. That's a very uh, stoic mindset that you have and uh, apply to cannabis cultivation, and, and I love that. I think you're you're exactly right, and um, I'm sure you bring that mindset into the grow operations that you can consult with. Um, talking about uh, new clients and you know your your business, so um, what are would you say are the top three most common problems that you you get called in for um, at your firm? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I'd say the most common one would be uh, issues with pests and, and okay. uh, pesticide resistant pests and because the industry, everyone in the industry struggles with that. Mm. Although I've been able to develop a, you know, a regimen and an IPM program that where insects, it's impossible for them to build up resistance to. But that's scientific acumen. And I would actually, that would lead to a more simple way to state it. There is just a lack of scientific knowledge out in the industry. Now, when you bring people that, you know, say with horticulture degrees in, well, you need that. But most of them, because of the laws, have not had eyes on cannabis. So say they know that, uh, you know, they know what all the nutri- micro and macronutrients are and that they can become deficient. But how does it manifest on the plant? You need to, you know, there's subtle differences in sh- in colors and shades and, you know, in the difference between a, a leaf that's drooping and a leaf that's bending, you know, for example, or a clawing, you know, it, there are very, a lot of manifestations that look similar with different causal, with different causes. So to be able to discern exactly what that is, diagnostics, you need not only uh, to understand the science, which I would say that's the biggest problem in the industry. You need to love science. You need to, but you also have to be able to apply it with your instincts. Mm. And that's where the real green thumb comes in. You have to have yeah. the knowledge, but you have to be able to apply it correctly. That's the disconnect that you've seen with um, kind of the the quote unquote academic world entering into the cannabis space and uh, perhaps not knowing how to apply that or transition that knowledge to the cannabis plant in particular. Oftentimes, and that's not, you know, that's not a universal statement, but um, that is generally, generally, I would say the biggest problem. Uh, yeah. Finding someone with the the varied skill set, the broad skill set, with uh, everything from you know understanding science, applying it, knowing the business side, knowing how to manage crews, 
understanding how to be a leader to get the most out of your crews, to have them respect their jobs enough to do a good job when you're not there to watch them. That's huge. It is. And there's just so many things that go into it. And uh, it's hard to find someone with that understanding. You know, on the on the flip side, Jason, I'm sure that you've seen some success stories. Do you have one that comes to mind, kind of a, a turnaround where you entered into a situation that could have been a, a grow nightmare, um, but by the time you left and, and they're, you know, all the way up to this point today, um, they have been super successful? You know, I would, frankly, uh, I, I would cite Northwest Cannabis Solutions again. Okay. Um, you know, when I, when I got on there, they... Uh, we're having some basic troubles. Uh, as an example, the first thing that uh, they showed me, they asked me, what do you think's wrong with this room? And I looked at it and it looked to me, and you know, I mentioned a moment ago about the difference between bending leaves and drooping leaves. Well, mm-hmm. they said, why are these leaves drooping? I said, well, you, you notice the stem, it's actually bent here with a little bit of a claw uh, on, on the fingers of the leaves. And so I asked uh, about water temperature. And he said, no, no, it couldn't be the water temperature. We, everything's fine with that. What else do you think? And we went, and then I went through other questions because they did a good job of collecting data. Uh, you know, I talked about pH. We talked about, you know, uh, what's the nutrient regimen? Are you uh, flushing? You know, all these different things. But then we have eventually rounded out or and went in a circle right back to the water temperature. And I just asked, <laughs> well, can we go look at the records? And sure enough, they, those plants were getting hit with water uh, in the temperatures in the 40s as it was in the winter coming in. Mm. And uh, that anything under 50 degrees, well, anything really under 60 degrees, 60 degrees has the potential to lock up a plant in, in a nutrient lockout. That's mm-hmm. more difficult to bring out than, say, a nutrient lockout due to a salt buildup. Okay. So, so you know, we uh, one of the first things we did is put in a, a heat exchange system where the water ran through all the rooms, through pipes, was heated that way. And then it was the same temperature as the rooms when it got in. And so those plants felt like they're... I'll get into a nice warm bath. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, there's a number of other things that we did and that, you know, probably don't have time to go into all the different things that had to Mm -hmm. fix at that part two, (laughs) part two. Yes. But, uh, you know, was able to increase production by 30 percent. And again, we took the top spot. It was, you know, I I am proud of that. And and I'm proud of my team that helped us achieve that. And uh, we took the top spot in the nation for uh, the rest of my time there. And and I was headhunted away, frankly, uh, about a year later. Um, but but I, I would say that would be my favorite victory, for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah, definitely. Have you ever come across a client with uh, issues related to licensing or lab testing that maybe uh, your company took part in helping to solve? Absolutely. One I alluded to earlier when uh, we were talking about the HVAC system, but that gram-negative yeah. biotolerant bacteria, which is, you know, even just so, because I, I love, I just love science, right? So I, I already knew that that was associated with fish, but that wasn't an d- angle that anyone in the building would have ever drifted to. You hmm. know, they would have just been kind of spinning their wheels endlessly. And they had failed multiple crops in a row before I got there, which left the company on the verge of, of failure. And, you know, with the profit margins the way they are, you, you just can't have multiple crops fail in a row. So, um, and with licensing, of course, it's it's always difficult. I mean, there's different challenges in every state. Um, you know, I have a partner down in uh, San Diego who usually handles the uh, you know the the legal side for my clients. Okay. Because well, because it's just so complicated, and yeah. in every state, you there need are, a subject matter expert. You do, and with all things, you know, I mean, put, identify people with the ability to get done what what you need to get done and put them in a position, give them some responsibility and put them in a position to succeed. And then success for the company will follow as well. Just got to make sure that the right to provide the right oversight to make sure that those, uh, those principles and standards are being followed. Definitely. Are there states in your opinion, Jason, that have uh, maybe better licensing programs than others or better testing programs than others that, Again, you know, new markets that are coming online every day, like let's take Oklahoma, for example, they're, you know, one of the, the newer markets, um, you know, are, are they, you know, their licensing and testing, uh, you know, systems, are, are they good? Could they be improved upon? Are there other states that they could uh, learn from to strengthen their models? 
You know, I, I would say it's, it is good. It's robust, but I think it use a little more development. I know a lot of growers probably are frustrated by the amount of testing for different things, everything from botrytis, powdered mildews, um, funguses, molds, uh, you know, bacteria. There's so mm -hmm. many different things that can make people sick. While that may frustrate some growers, we need it. And if you're doing your job right, uh, it, it, you don't need to be frustrated by that. We're trying, we need to keep people safe. And this is medicine for people. And even for the people using it recreationally, do we want to make them sick? I mean, you know, what are we, Philip Morris? You know, we're going to put cancer causing chemicals on a product we're going to give the cancer patients. I, right? I believe that's immoral. I agree and, with you. And I'd love to dive into your favorite style of growing. So maybe let's just say outdoor, greenhouse, indoor, you know, let's start there and, and then get into the weeds. Well, that, I mean, the boy, that's a big question, actually. And <clears throat> my favorite, I mean, I, I love indoor, uh, you know, you can, the okay. quality that you can get uh, growing indoor is, you, know, you just can't match it. That being said, the most uh, profitable and, and efficient way to grow is in greenhouses. Mm. And um, I would recommend greenhouses over indoor if you had to make a choice, if you're able to do both. Uh, a grow that I'm working with right now does both. Uh, Almar Farms, they're fantastic. Okay. But I did, you know, as an example, I did find, so we'll say Sea of Green. You know, when we're mm -hmm. talking about scale, my favorite would be Sea of Green. Um, some of the problems that I encountered when I got the Almar Farms, for example, they were they had these 10 foot tall plants that they're sticking in their greenhouses. and. Now, on a very sm on a small scale, if you're just growing in one room, even if it's a uh, perpetual cycle, you can get more production with those big plants. But as soon as you start having multiple rooms that you're trying to schedule out and uh, keep on that perpetual cycle, it's about turning over harvest and growing those big plants. You know, as opposed to sea green, you're going to miss out on one or two harvests a year uh, in most cases, which will end up being more loss. You know, it's that ROI again, you'll right. have more loss with that than you would over, you know, if you're trying to grow those big plants and get a little production freeze harvest. So I would say see a green, uh, on scale. I do like core fiber, which is a cocoa core. Um, it's kind of a blank slate. Uh, you know, you want your pH a little lower, um, you know, a little more calcium magnesium, but, uh, frankly, that blank slate, uh, as long as your program is right, uh, yields a lot of advantages. Hmm. So being a, a YouTube community uh, where we showcase growers such as yourself around the world, uh, we have you know tens of thousands of fans, subscribers that go into the comments and, and they share their personal opinion on how they grow. And a lot of times they, they critique the growers that we, we film, yeah. uh, which is accepted and welcomed. I love it. Uh, yeah. But what about some some bad advice that maybe you have heard uh, along your your journey as a grower that you can help squash today? Well, you know there there is one that I cite often when this question comes up, and um, that would be like uh, you know sugars and bud hardeners and bud sweeteners, these really really expensive products that you're dumping into your medium, and mo for whatever reason the the knowledge common knowledge in the industry is that those sugars help uh, sweeten up those buds and get up in the plant and you know it's good for the plants but the problem is <clears throat> a, under, just even a simple understanding of photosynthesis will tell you that plants are incapable of taking sugars up through their roots so hmm. while you do want some sugar in your uh, in your soil or your, to feed your microbial uh, flora and your microbial mat um, which does help you know some of those issues with the bud hardening and sweetening and all but you can, you know, molasses works. It's just a simple thing about feeding microbes as opposed to stuffing okay. sugars in to get into the plant tissue. Now plants, per, they create sugars they t through photosynthesis. They take all nutrients or salts, they take the nutrient salts up, they combine it with CO2 and the light to create sugars that they distribute through the plants, which the plants are a lot like us. They have two vessels, like, you know, we have veins and arteries. They have a, a xylem and a phloem vessel. And they take the nutrient salts up through the, the xylem vessels they create sugars, store them in the big leaves, which also another little side note, don't take all your big leaves off. Those are your sugar storage repositories that if another part of the plant gets damaged, they use the phloem vessels, which is the other vessel, to distribute those sugars to other areas of the plant to keep it healthy. I love it. This is why growers are hiring you, right? <laughs> you are a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> well, you know, I suppose, uh, I suppose I know a thing or two about growing, but uh, I, I'll say I'm passionate about it. and. Um, you know, I, I do believe I have a lot to offer.
Yeah, you're you're constantly learning and evolving your trade. I I love it. Um, hey, so though, I, one thing one thing I know for sure is I know nothing at all. Constantly learning. There you go. Uh, it's a good mindset to have. Um, so I want to do a, a rapid fire round. So I'd love uh, your uh, number one most important thing to know and implement for each of these areas in your grow operation. So let's start with uh, water and nutrients. What's the number one thing that you should uh, know and implement as a grower? Water and nutrients. I would say, you know, most growers know they need to pH their water. Understand why, you know, try to understand why. Don't be a system grower to where you just know that you need to use a pH meter. Know why you're doing it. It's to create a soluble, you know, the salts in a certain pH range become soluble and so they can be taken up into the plant. So understand why you're doing things. Okay. And under, try to, and also don't just, uh, you know, memorize what all the nutrients are, the macro and the micronutrients. You know, the molybdenum, the boron, of the borons of the world that a lot of growers, uh, you know, I know your elements, on, you, know. you know, your elements. Yeah. Know so uh, same question. What's the most important thing to know and implement for lighting setup? Well, if I would say because a lot of people are growing with LEDs, make sure you have a grower that understands fertilizer science to the point where you can make the adjustments because the spectrum difference oftentimes a lot of times it'll be as simple as adding calcium and magnesium. Although, of course, phosphates are carried into the plant on the back of uh, magnesium. So, you know, they kind of interact together. But uh, I would say make sure that your fertilizer adjustments are correct if, uh, according to your lighting, especially if it's LED. Nice. I like it. Next up, IPM strategy. Well, that's, uh, that's a that's tough a, one to consolidate into. Well, a, y yes and no. The, th the thing is, most so uh, industry knowledge will tell you that you know you need to alternate modes of action uh, to help prevent uh, the bugs from building up a resistance to your products. But that's really that's really a, a little short sighted. So, combining modes of action. Now, if you combine modes of action, the bugs it's impossible for them to build up a resistance to them. But it's very tricky. You have to match up the half-life of each of your pesticides and also the persistence rate. So, because if they you don't, whatever whatever uh, product you're using that has the long the longest persistence rate, they will build up resistance to that. Mm. And even if there are bugs that have built up resistance to one, use two or three of them at the same time. But again, they have to have different modes of action. You have to match up half-life. You also have to match up persistence rate. And, and then also the ratios. You can't just dump them all with the same, you know, ratios you, you would use if they were standalone products. Hmm. Well said. Trimming. Most important thing to know and implement with trimming. I would say, you know, every, so most companies, want, you know, want to do hand trimming, it seems. And it's because it does create a, a better smoke. You know, it's more the smokeability is better. It's uh, okay. it just tastes a little cleaner often. It looks better. But you know, wet versus dry trimming, you know, frankly, if you wet trim with the right machine in the right way, and the biggest mistake is people just cut down the whole room and then start running it through a machine. And once your product gets a little soft and soggy, it bruises up, the chlorophyll gets trapped up. It, it does affect the smokeability. It looks kind of crappy. It looks like it was washed in something, mm -hmm. you know, the color, it just, it's discolored often. So I would say take down your rooms a section at a time and if you're and have a freezer or a fridge on hand, because uh, if you have product that's starting to get soft, put it in that fridge, put it in yeah. a fridge or freezer to because it will maintain its rigidity. And then you won't have those problems with the uh, discoloration and uh, running it through your trimmer. Excellent. Last one, quality insurance. Most important thing to know and implement. Quality assurance. <laughs> The most important is make, and this is one I've found a lot of owners have a hard time uh, understanding is flushing. Mm. Um, uh, you know, it's, I actually put up signs at, uh, at, at well, one grow in particular that, uh, you know, sometimes I'll try to do little tricks like, like this, but they just said less is more. More branches doesn't always mean more buds. More leaves doesn't always mean more, you know, heavier buds. Uh, more fertilizer does not necessarily mean a better more but uh, heavier buds or more or a uh, higher quality of smoke in fact as we know it makes it worse mm. so don't be afraid to flush and so qa you know make sure that you have a clean product also uh make sure that nothing your ipm program isn't spraying things if you do it properly and start through veg stop as soon as you see flowers make sure you're not putting 
uh, you know, bad pesticides or bad products on flowers. Mm, I love it. Thank you so much for that, that rapid fire knowledge. Um, so I, I'm curious, I hear a lot in the YouTube comments on Canicribs episodes and Deep Roots episodes about nutrient deficiencies and solutions for those. Um, could you tell me maybe some of the more common ones that you see on, on the commercial scale and, and how you solve them? For sure. Um, well, I guess I'd start with a pH. You know, you have to, you know, it's recommended to use a different uh, pH level according to the, you know, the type of soil you're using. So, for example, peat, uh, something that's peat based, you'd have your you'd pH at around 6.3. Um, most people use core fiber, the cocoa core, which I do prefer as well. And you want it closer to, say, a 5.8. So without that knowledge, you know, a lot of people just end up doing 6-3 in core fiber and then it doesn't leave all the nutrients available in the levels that the plant needs. So and also the understanding that, um, you know, one that I'd run into is, uh, you know, magnesium deficiencies with purpling stalks. It's actually a phosphorus deficiency, but because phosphorus enters into the plant on the back of magnesium, it, you know, it's still classified as a magnesium deficiency. Um, and magnesium and calcium work together in the plants as well, just like it does with us. So with deficiencies, you know, look for multiple signs. If you only have one deficiency on there, it's likely deficient in actual deficient. If you see multiple deficiencies on there, there's a good chance that it's locked out. And then you need to figure out why. Is it due to a, a cold water that you use, a bad water temperature? Is it something atmospheric? Is it a it, most common would be a salt buildup because all nutrients are salts. And most uh, nutrient lines have sodium chloride in it, which is basically table salt. That's the bad salt that builds up in your uh, mm. in your soil that locks plants out. That's difficult to get them out. Although if it happens due to a salt buildup, a sugar solution uh, running through your medium, the salts will attach to the sugars, so you don't have to put a hundred gallons through the pot. And uh, usually we'll rebalance it. Although a, a mineral matrix of some sort treat it like a bran muffin. You you got to reboot that system. Um, but I would say, you know, look for multiple signs, one sign, and then, uh, discern what's causing it. Excellent. There's a lot of advice there the past 15 minutes. So <laughs> I know a, a bunch of growers are going to have to keep going back, pause, listen to it, rewind. I hear that a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, knowledge there. I appreciate you sharing. So let's talk directly to, uh, the topic of, uh, a new business owner. So yeah. let's take Oklahoma, for example, there's a lot of new owners of grow operations, especially when the, the barrier to entry to a market is lowered financially or, you know, legally, it's a little bit easier to start a grow operation. So what are, uh, would you say is like, uh, some of the, the top mistakes that a, a new grower will make and, um, without having to hire a consultant quite yet, like maybe they can remedy something internally. I know we talked a little bit uh, about this subject uh, prior, but maybe just dig in a little bit deeper on uh, the topic of new business owners in the space and, and what they can do well. Well, as far as ownership goes, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to lean on the people that you hire to, to manage your operation, but also do your due diligence, of course, and to verify that they are what they say they are. Uh, which is not always easy in this industry and looking for industry standards that are successful in the industry i mean you know for the restaurant industry you can google it but it's in cannabis it's very secretive and so hmm. it's very difficult for someone without the actual experience to just know what those standards are so they're left to try to figure it out on the fly and with a startup that oftentimes can be really bad so i would say put your ego aside for ownership and managers and management growers Put your ego aside, be willing to be wrong and and be willing to do the research or make mm. the phone calls. Do whatever it takes to figure out what those standards, successful standards are. And uh, just attack it like a dog on a bone and don't get frustrated <laughs> when you can't find it. Yeah, I love it. And And going back to the philosophies you mentioned earlier of essentially stoicism and Kaizen. You know, stoicism of, uh, you know, uh, you can't control everything and it's your yeah. perception of uh, what's happening um, and then detaching your emotion and ego from that. Um, and then also uh, the philosophy of Kaizen of constant self-improvement, always learning, always being eager to, you know, try new things and, and learn how to solve it a different way. Well, you know, that I that's such a big thing in the industry. And, you know, I don't know, maybe a good way to put that is, you know, 
in this position, you have to be confident in your abilities, but you better, you know, be willing to do the research and constantly learn. And, you know, confidence without humility is merely arrogance. Mm. And it's hard to it's hard to improve or get better or uh, even maintain as an arrogant grower. And uh, another, you know, sometimes I put these signs up like, you know, less is more. Um, another one that I've used in the past is ego free growing. Um, mm. You know, put it aside. You know, we're cultivators of life and embrace that. Embrace the science. Don't be afraid, even if you don't have any background in it. You know, I mean, just just start simple. Um, you know, I, I subscribe to a, uh, a service that allows me uh, access to all the different, uh, you know, university libraries. Uh, you know, anyone can access most oh, of them. Cool. But, but it, the, you know, there's a service that allows me access to all the published papers, some of them even before they're published. And I would say, do your research. Start with peer reviewed articles for, on horticulture and okay. then and then cross reference it against cannabis specific articles to try to confirm or uh add to that base of scientific knowledge, just plant science. I and, love it. And just keep researching, just be just voracious, just read, read, read. I know most people love, you know, people learn in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say, don't be afraid to read, you know, a lot of these articles and peer reviewed articles, you're not gonna find videos on. So don't mm -hmm. be afraid to read, but, don't limit yourself in the areas or the method your methods for of research either and just just devour as much as you can yeah i, I love it um so let's talk about your firm here so um maybe some new projects on the horizon that you can share any trends or developments in the you know cannabis industry today um that you're really looking forward to well, you know, I of course legalization, federal legalization, yeah. but we're all looking forward to that, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I am excited about what's happening with hemp. Uh, you know, we discussed interstate commerce before because mm -hmm. it's uh, getting medicine to people that need it that weren't able to have it before. But especially in cannabis, um, you know, with my company, you know, just to, took over a uh, management of uh, a farm here just outside of Olympia in uh, Washington. Um, it's a hybrid indoor uh, and greenhouse grow. Um, very excited about that project. Also has 40 acres. We're looking to uh, wow. do hemp next year as well. Okay. Um, but there, there'll be some licensing challenges to that that we're going to sort through over the next season. Um, I have a, a, another project of developing in uh, Michigan right now in Detroit. Um, you know, my consultancy, I have managers on the ground handling day to day on the East Coast uh, out in, in Michigan. Um, another one up in uh, Canada that we're discussing with. Um, also in discussions with uh, TCMS, which is the, uh, I mentioned them earlier. The HVAC, HVAC company, company, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're developing some, pro we're talking about developing some programs to work together on a, in a JV, a joint venture. Uh, so a lot of projects and, um, of course, always welcome more. Uh, depends on what they are, of course. Uh, but, um, you know, I have we have a great team and, um, you know, we can take on most projects. Right on. Well, I'm going to put another one on your plate for the future, whether it's Michigan or Washington or a future grow operation. I'd love to film a Can of Cribs or Deep Roots episode with you. Um, you are a wealth of knowledge and uh, I'd be, uh, you know, uh, very much looking forward to seeing one of your grow operations in person and, and sharing that with the world. I would love that, Nick. That'd be fantastic. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun, too. It'd be a lot yeah. of fun, too. Uh, you know, and uh, just, just say the word and uh, we'll get that set up. Um, have a number that uh, in mind that I'd love to love to show you. In fact, that's awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today, Jason. Um, did we miss anything or anyone that you'd like to cover before we wrap up here? Uh, you know, uh, we I think we talked about a lot of good issues. Um, you yeah. know, I would say if we're, we're talking about maybe some of the farms are visiting. You know, I have uh, another one that I'm uh, working with. Uh, actually, the uh, my friend that. Uh, I got into this with that got cancer uh, mm. originally. He owns a farm now that they're doing some very unique and interesting things with a uh, sustainable uh, growth there. They took a, uh, you know, dead and rotting trees out of the forest, buried them underneath their plants uh, to provide a source of food. Whoa. I mean, talk about clean medicine, I have not right? heard of that before. Yep, wow. 111 Ranch, 111 Ranch, check them out. And uh, right they, they have a beautiful grow. Um, but really, I would say, uh, you know, for other prospective growers out there looking to get into it or current growers that are uh, struggling or have, have having issues, just don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to be wrong. And 
Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to ask questions to people you know or don't know. Reach out, you know, make comments on the podcast, you know, get on Instagram and ask questions to growers. You never know where you may find an answer. And again, don't be afraid to research um, because I am, you know, this is a growing industry and it's going to keep growing. No pun intended. Mm-hmm. I, um, so I'm, I'm just excited about uh, just the growth and the evolution of it. And yeah. and maybe most importantly, the med- the medicine. Yeah. And being able to wake up and do what we love and helping people at the same time. It's always a good feeling. <laughs> love what you do. You never work a day in, the, in your life, they say. And I, I find that to be true. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jason. Um, I appreciate you and uh, really looking forward to sharing all this knowledge with the world. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, I had a lot of fun today. And uh, yeah, this, this was great. And uh, thank you very much. Take care. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate your time, and I hope you learned something new. I want to show some love to Quest for making this episode possible so we can continue documenting history with the pioneers of our global cannabis industry. If you need help controlling your environment, Quest definitely has you covered. You can check out all their different units at growershouse.com. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your network. And thank you again for listening. If you have any recommendations of who we should interview next, leave in the YouTube comments.